Hi, welcome to Daily Data Structures. My name is Abhinava Singh, and I will be your guide to deciphering all of the complex material that lies within this series of topics. I would recommend watching the series in order as I build examples off of each other. Also, I would encourage knowing a little bit of Java, as I might utilize it for some examples and coding problems you will encounter later in the course. However, if you don't totally understand Java, there's no need to worry, as I'll try my best to focus on major concepts of data structures. So, today we'll be talking about asymptotic analysis and address questions such as what is runtime, how to quantify it, and how to analyze upper bounds in our code. And most importantly, we will be learning about big O notation and its consequences in algorithm design. So, let's start talking about intuition first. Let's take the following example. Say you have an inventory which takes one minute to read the inventory to disk and then takes five minutes to process each of those items in the inventory. So we can say that the total runtime is 300 seconds plus 5n seconds, where n is the number of items. While to the naive passerby, it may seem that the bottleneck is actually in, read, in the act of reading an inventory item to disk, i.e. 300 seconds, the truth is, is that the number of inventory items is the real bottleneck. What happens when the number of items exceeds 60? In fact, let's assume we're doing an inventory check of every single Costco in the United States. So you can see that the number n becomes huge, and you can now see why the 5n in 300 plus 5n becomes the bottleneck of this function and in this algorithm. So when looking for upper bounds on our algorithms, we can use something called asymptotic analysis which is just analyzing situations when n becomes huge to find upper bounds on our algorithms. However, the way we do this is by using something called big O notation. So I'm sure I've mentioned it above, and you're probably wondering right now, what exactly is this big O notation? Before we get to a formal definition, let's just start with easing ourselves into understanding what an upper bound really is. So let's take two functions. Let's say, t of n is equal to 20n, and let's let f of n equal 500n. So we notice the following. When n is equal to 0, t is equal to 0, and f is equal to 0. When n is equal to 1, t is equal to 20, and f is equal to 500. When n is equal to 2, t is equal to 40, and f is equal to 1000. So on and so forth as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we can, as we can see, as n gets larger, t and f both increase. However, the rate at which f increases is much larger than the rate at which t increases. So we can make the following statements, that t the range of t of n is within that of f of n. We can also say that f of n is the upper bound of t of n, because it's always going to be greater than t of n no matter what n you choose. Finally, you can also say that t of n is in big O of f of n. In fact, the upper bound statement above and the big O statement I made below are literally the same thing. And intuitively, big O is just saying that there is an, there's a function that is an upper bound of another function. So this gets us to the formal definition. Let's take two functions, f of n and t of n. So O of f of n is the set of all functions t of n that satisfy the following condition. There exist positive constants c and capital N, such that for all lowercase n larger than or equal to capital N, t of n is less than c times f of n. I cannot stress how important this concept is in algorithm analysis and in design in general. Knowing this is the base of every single data structure analysis we'll be doing later on in this course. So now let's talk about big O proofs. Let's start with something simple, and then let's, we'll start to go on and do a little bit more complex examples as we go forward. So to, to, let's start with our original example. To prove t of n is in big O of f of n, all you have to do is pick a number c and a number capital N, such that the definition is satisfied. So in our example, we had capital T of n is equal to 20n, and, cap, and f of n is equal to 500n. So let's let c equal 1 and capital N equal 1. So then we get the following. 20n is less than or equal to 1c 
times 500n. This follows that 20n is less than or equal to 500n. You can show by induction, or the logic we had above, that 20n will always be less than 500n, for all n greater than or equal to 1. Now that we've shown that, that, that satisfies the following definition. So t of n is indeed in big O of f of n. So that was a very simple example. So let's get into something a little bit more involved. Let's let f of n equal to n to the power n. And let's let g of n equal n factorial. So we need to prove that n factorial is in big O of n to the power n. So the, while this seems a little complicated, let's start with just writing down everything we know about these two functions. We know that n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3, so on and so forth, times 3 times 2 times 1. We also know that n is less than or equal to n itself, right? n minus 1 is less than or equal to n, n minus 2 is less than or equal to n, n minus 3 is less than or equal to n, so on and so forth, right? So as a result, we can say that n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 is less than or equal to n times n times n times n times n n times. And that's equivalent to saying n to the power n. So if we take c equal to 1 and capital N equal to 1, then we can show that n factorial is indeed less than 1 times n to the power n, where capital N for all uh, lowercase n greater than 1. So that means that n factorial is in big O of n to the power n, as we've satisfied the definition and the condition. So now let's get, now that we understand how to do a lot of these proofs, let's talk conceptually about the important consequences of big O notation. The first thing is uh, the following statement. Um, n, 10 to, the, 10 to the 7th times n is in big O of n. This is a true statement. If we pick c equal to 10 to the power 8 and capital N equal to 0, then it can easily be shown that the above is true, because 10 to the power 7 times n is less than 10, 10, 10 to the power 8 of n, right? Um, this shows that the big O doesn't really care about most constants. It is primarily concerned with what happens when lowercase n becomes huge and dwarfs any contributions by most constants. However, this is not to say that all uh, constants don't matter. Let's take e to the power 3n. That is, e to the power 3n is not in big O of e to the n because e to the 3n differs from e to the n by e to the 2n, which is a huge difference. It's orders of magnitude bigger. So not while most constants can be disregarded, not all of them. And for example, constants that are in the exponential or um, other constants, those cannot be disregarded. So the second important consequence of big O notation is another statement that's also true. You can say that n is in big O of n to the power 5. That's also a true statement. And that shows that big O notation has the potential to be misleading. Just because something is in big O of n to the 5 time doesn't mean that it's slow. It could be in big O n time as well, just like in this case. n is in big O of n. So... That really goes to show that the big O notation doesn't really tell us the whole story. Just knowing an upper bound doesn't tell, only tells us a little bit about the runtime. It is the equivalent of the following conversation. Somebody asking someone, how tall is Michael Jackson? To which you reply, well, he's definitely smaller than the diameter of Saturn. While this is a true statement, it really doesn't give us a good example of how big Michael Jordan really is. Likewise, just knowing the big O notation doesn't really tell us exactly what the runtime is. However, it is an important piece of information. So to get a more complete view of the runtime, we can look at the theta notation and omega notation, which we'll do later on in this course to get a complete view of runtime.